All right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this session on the high school leaders paper. Um, I'm Chris Elliott. I use he, him pronouns, and the director of the Outdoor School Program. And pleased to introduce uh, three individuals that have been doing a whole heck of a lot of work, um, not only supporting the work of high school volunteers at Outdoor School, but doing the research on it. And what's really cool about this is you all know, because you're engaged in this work, the difference that you can make in the lives of the students who participate at Outdoor School. This is a way to actually impact the way that we think about Outdoor School, the way that others think about Outdoor School and Outdoor Education in general, and really add to um, a body of knowledge that in some ways does exist and in other ways doesn't exist yet, so that other researchers, other programs, other states, other universities can look at the great work that all of you are doing and tap into the success stories and learn from things that maybe don't go well. And at the same time, this research helps us get better ourselves. The other thing that it does is it gives us a very valuable story and opportunity when we go before legislators, when they say, prove it, we actually can. And so um, just want to start by introducing these folks and thank them for doing this work. It is challenging yet rewarding. And the other really cool thing is these folks from um, a research standpoint, ontology standpoint, epistemology, all come with very, very different backgrounds. And so while that provides really cool research, it also makes it more challenging when you sit down with each other and look at data and approach it from your personal perspective and background and identity and the way that you look at um, research. So um, I think the end result is really cool stuff. So um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, Dan Prince, um, who you hopefully know by now, um, Friends of Outdoor School, who is a participant um, on this, this research project. Also would like to introduce Dr. Spirit Brooks, who's the Outdoor School Research Assessment and Evaluation Coordinator. And uh, last and certainly not least, um, Dr. Stephen Braun, who um, is it contracts with us. Um, it provides a really, really cool opportunity because we are a funding agency as part of our role. So Steve really brings that credibility as an outside consultant to make sure that um, there's no bias in how we are conducting our research and that our research doesn't impact funding anyway. So um, these three individuals are, are superstars and I'm really excited to hear what they have to say today and I will turn it over to them. Um, so Chris introduced us. Um, thanks. Thank you, Chris. I just want to acknowledge um, our OSU Extension Service Outdoor School Research Assistant, Shereen Springer, who wasn't able to be here with us today. Um, she actually broke her arm in a roller skating accident and had the opportunity to go get some x-rays this morning so that she could hopefully get her arm cast off. So certainly um, she wanted to be here with us. Shireen is um, a doctoral student at the University of Oregon in the Critical Sociocultural Studies and Education Program, has um, some background um, with outdoor education. She's from Montana originally, and also um, has done a ton of work in communities with community engaged research and with youth participatory action research. So she's kind of the resident expert on YPAR um, on the team, which we'll talk about um, in a little bit. So just, just wanna acknowledge Shireen's impact on this project as well. I know that most folks in the room are um, very familiar with land acknowledgement, but I did wanna take a moment this morning to, um, to acknowledge the land that we're on. All, in, all outdoor education takes place on indigenous homelands. And I think it's very important for us to um, frame our day together by acknowledging that we, at least those of us in the Willamette Valley, are on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Kalapuya peoples. Um, those peoples are represented within the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Sluts Indians. So, and those folks include Takelma, Umpqua, Malala, Rogue River, Kalapuya, and Shasta people. And those folks have lived on the lands that we call home since time immemorial. Um, so for those of you coming from the Portland metro area, I know some of you are joining us from there today. I'd like to recognize that Portland's native community is very diverse and vibrant and is descended from over 380 tribes. 
and that many Native folks in Portland are multi-ethnic and multi-tribal, and that's important to recognize as well. But the Portland metro area also lies on the traditional homelands of the Multnomah, the Cowlitz, the Wasco, the Kathlamet peoples, the Clackamas, um, bands of Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, the Malala, and many, many other tribes who made and continue to make their homes along the Columbia River. And acknowledge that some of you are joining us from Eastern and Southern Oregon. So the traditional homelands of the Confederated Tribes of Umatilla, Warm Springs, Burns Paiute, and Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Indians. Um, again, really important that we take the time to acknowledge um, that the settler colonial legacy of displacement and settlement, settlement and acknowledge the long and most importantly continuous relationship with the lands on which we gather for meetings, even virtual. So um, with that, I just wanna pay respects to our ancestors and elders past and present. All right, I'm gonna pass the mic to Dan. Thanks, Spirit um, and everyone. So a couple um, gratitudes, one a little tongue in cheek. Uh, thank you, Chris, for dropping ontology and epistemology into the conversation. That makes my little philosophy major heart so happy. Um, I, uh, I, I have a bachelor's degree in philosophy, and so um, I have I had an opportunity to learn how to type those words very quickly um, back in the olden days. Um, and then, Spirit, thank you for that beautiful land acknowledgement. Um, I uh, I'm here in what we now call the western end of the Columbia River Gorge, and I every day I'm grateful for the um, for the stewardship that. Um, that the indigenous folks here um, have bestowed on this land. And I learned something from the land all the time. And I just really um, want to pay respect to those elders and ancestors and um, the people who are here now. So thank you for that. Um, I just want to, this is kind of framing today. And this is how I'm thinking about our session um, today. Uh, so it's a little story about what we're going to do. Um, and when we were planning this, I was trying to get my head around like what we really wanted to accomplish today. And so I just said these things and I was like, okay, this makes sense to me. So maybe it'll make sense to you too. Um, research that what we're going to share today, um, research found this, the found this, it, it's occurring. Um, it's not occurring everywhere. It's not occurring all the time, but it is occurring. And, and um, we're really excited about it. I think you're gonna be excited about it too. This is stuff that we see and have seen at Outdoor School in Oregon. Um, so it's really grounded in the experience of young people here. Um, those of you who are working in outdoor school, working with youth, working with high school youth, have the expertise and ability to do these things. Many of you are doing these things because we saw you doing them, or you're here because you have the will to do these things. And the ability to do these things will be informed by this research. And so we're really happy to be able to share this with you so that you can um, really do great work with young people. Um, okay, the, this next bullet, here is some money so you can actually do them thoroughly and intentionally and planfully. So we're going to uh, present to you a, a proposal um, for uh, an upcoming opportunity that um, we're hoping will become real. And that is, um, we recognize that that work takes resources. We have to pay people to do work. We have to pay you to do this work. And so um, we think there's going to be a great opportunity for you to actually really thoughtfully and intentionally and planfully implement some of the recommendations that we have here for you. Um, and then we want to know how we can help you um, uh, moving forward into the next years um, so that more and more uh, high school youth can benefit from this incredible stuff. So that's kind of how I'm thinking about today. And um, I'm really excited to get started. Okay, so today um, we want to kind of frame the day um, with the research that we did with high school leaders uh, so, that we, so that we can better support um, your ability to understand how high school leaders can develop critical consciousness. And we'll, we'll talk about what that is through teaching for equity consciousness. And again, we'll talk about that as well. So um, we hope to address what critical consciousness is, how it's developed and expressed in high school leaders, what teaching for equity consciousness is and how that occurs at outdoor school and then reflect and celebrate existing outdoor school programming, which teaches for equity consciousness and develops critical consciousness. So sort of the, the, 
the the root of um, of our research was really grounded in what was happening on the ground at Outer School. And then we also are going to share, as Dan alluded to, some inf information about an upcoming grant opportunity that's related to um, helping you with um, professional development with high school leaders. Slide, please. Uh, we hope that today um, you'll come out of this with a better understanding of what inclusive equity specific approaches to develop the development of critical consciousness with high school leaders is by teaching for equity consciousness and that you'll understand a little more about an upcoming funding opportunity um, that will help you develop and or improve your high school leader programming so that it is more um, deeply embedded in equity consciousness that helps high school leaders develop critical consciousness. Can you slide please? All right, I'm gonna pass the mic to Steve now. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I, I'm uploading a file. It says HSL Research Brief, Volume 8. And um, what I'd like is for everyone to open that. The next three slides, I'm gonna tour it. Um, and so while you're opening that, I'm gonna just kind of tell you what it is. And then once it's up, if you can give me some sort of, you know, motion or something in here, the thumb up or the clap or just some way that I know that people have this up um, would be really helpful. And what I'm asking again is that you can follow along in the PDF and um, what we have here with the slides. So um, broadly, we engaged in research um, over the last several years um, and <clears throat> published a paper, which I'll put that in the, um, the chat as well, but I'm gonna wait so that you don't have two things popping in and doesn't get, you don't get distracted by it. Um, and then this brief is just a, a easier to digest synopsis, but we hope that if you're interested in this, that you then follow up and read um, more deeply in the published paper. Uh, and of course, reach out to any of us if you have any questions. So I think I saw one or two thumbs up that people have this document open. Um, Okay, I see one. Thank you, Priscilla. Okay. All right. Well, I want to. Okay, I'm seeing some. Great. This is helpful. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so if you go to page five of the research brief, and you'll notice this same awesome picture here. Um, first, I want to talk to you about what teaching for equity consciousness is. And again, these are things that we saw that you were all were doing here. Um, so if you know evaluation language, which we talk about a lot, these are your inputs. These are the things you're doing. We'll get to critical consciousness, which is the outcomes, the things which happen. <clears throat> Essentially, um, well, well, let me break down equity consciousness first. And so it is, um, hold on, let me pull this up here. Okay, I'm actually gonna read the definition that's in the orange box first around equity consciousness. And these are just the pieces that we broke down from it. So equity consciousness is when people are aware of or think about, think about how others are being treated. This includes how well they understand the many types of unfair treatment and how willing they are to join the task of finding fair solutions. So this we broke it down into four pieces here in bullet points, right, in awareness, <clears throat> understanding what fair and equitable treatment is, understanding inequity, and then a willingness to involve. So teaching from equity, teaching for equity consciousness flows from this. And <clears throat> there's four main, you know, um, we would say elements or tenants. Um, and you have this here in the lower right hand corner of the research brief as well, but I'm going to um, just summarize them. So first, it requires excellent and equitable teaching. This is all the excellent um, and equitable work that you do as an, um, program designers, instructors, and um, support network. Ultimately, the responsibility is on adults. And I think it's a really important thing to think about is that we are, um, as adults, the ones who are responsible for making sure that this um, is occurring. <clears throat> all intersecting elements of children's identity. Not just one or two, but all of them. And those things are um, included and embraced and um, just deeply considered. 
And then finally, um, and I'll just read the full bullet point um, from the brief that traditional school practices do not work for all children and that equitable education requires practical, practical changes. And I think if we reflect on, at least if I reflect on my um, time in public schools and my time as an educator, it's very clear that um, traditional school practices do not work for all children. And I think all of you probably know that really deeply in your bones. Okay, so now we're gonna go to page three. So I just talked about teaching for equity consciousness. Again, this is the work that you do. Now we're gonna talk about the outcome, the things which we see in um, youth. And this is critical consciousness. So I'll read this definition here. <clears throat> critical consciousness is how oppressed or marginalized people learn to critically analyze their social conditions and act to change on them. Marginalized youth benefit from social analysis, understanding and resisting unjust conditions through social action. So there's a lot of things that we can break down in there. Um, but when we try to distill this, not when, we, um, when this has been distilled into three key um, elements, there's this idea of critical reflection, looking at what's happening with a critical lens. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, that, that idea of mm, thinking critically about one's situation is really deeply rooted in um, experiential education and um, someone's work we lean on really heavy, which is uh, Paulo Freire. And, you know, we've, we've given you some technical terms. I'm gonna give you one more is this idea of praxis um, where students have this idea that they can make a difference in their life. It's kind of like self-efficacy and um, reflection is a very critical piece of that. And so, yeah, next, we found um, there's this idea of critical action. So we can take a simple action of you know, brushing my teeth or I can take a critical action of, not, as opposed to a regular action, of disrupting uh, a microaggression. And <clears throat> it's that action is dependent on the reflection as well. And so I guess I, we say this, I wanna just say these two pieces is that if we're encouraging students to really reflect critically, we also then need to provide an opportunity um, and training for them to act critically. Um, and then finally, political efficacy. And so obviously political can, can co cover many different things, um, can include the environment, can include um, racial awareness, can include um, you know, wealth shaming. There's just a lot of things that, that um, you know, students can inter uh, interface. And so it's important that when we're thinking about critical consciousness, that students have this sense that they can make a difference on their sphere of influence um, and, the, and the things which influence them. Dana Spirit, anything you want me, anything you'd like to add before I move to the next slide? Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> all of this begs the question of how can we support the development of critical consciousness? And so I'm just gonna read from this, but this is on page four. We can develop critical consciousness in high school leaders by teaching for equity consciousness. This is a social justice approach, which includes, and so these are things that we observed. <clears throat> they include staff facilitation of equity discussions, modeling the use of inclusive language, redirecting and disrupting exclusivity, microaggressions, involving high school students in planning and implementation of programming, evaluation, and trainings, and engaging young people in naming problems and action planning towards solution. So I just wanna say all of these pieces here are examples of teaching for equity consciousness that can lead to critical consciousness. Okay, so I feel like I just threw 
some pretty heavy language at you, but I'm hoping that everyone feels pretty confident in that. I just want to pause. Um, anyone have any like, you know, just quick questions? You can plop them in the chat um, or things that you want to verbalize about any of these, knowing we still have some more stuff um, to cover. And so I want to be a little quick on it if so. Hey, Steve, I'd just like to maybe throw in that um, one of the things that you'll find, I mean, the research brief is great, but one of the things that you'll find in the paper is some concrete examples of what those previous actions have looked like. So descriptions, stories of, of some things that that were that were seen, of things that staff members said, things that high school youth said. So um, when um, if you're considering it, I, I encourage you to read that longer paper so that you can, if you're thinking, okay, I kind of get this, but what does that actually look like? Like, what do I do? Like, what what have other people done? You'll be able to see some more details on what that actually um, can look, feel, or smell here. Like, yeah, thank you, Dan. And I I put the paper again in the chat, um, and I'll just say I you know I cruised over the quotes that are in here too. Those are really good examples. Um, and we had a conversation a couple of days ago where we said it's it's kind of hard to put these things into bulleted lists because it can look so different in every context. And so um, it's something that I think that just needs to be internalized. Yeah. So I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm passing it back over to Dr. Brooks. Thanks, Steve, and thanks, Dan. Um, so I, I kind of wanted to circle us back to um, and take a moment to bring folks' attention to the mission, vision, and values of the larger OSU Extension Outdoor School Program and how this ongoing high school leader research, of which this research brief and this paper were just kind of a beginning um, phase, how this is an example of how we are operationalizing justice, equity, access, diversity and inclusion and cultural responsiveness into our research and evaluation agenda and how central that is to, um, again, our mission, vision and values. So we wanted to um, take an opportunity to really encourage folks to take advantage of the resources that were that were developed and that we're continuing to develop to help folks operationalize these um, justice, equity, diversity, access, and inclusion principles into their programs. So um, our self-evaluation tools, for example, are, an, are one of the ways in which um, we are trying to help uh, programs in their um, in their drive to be more culturally responsive in their support of high school leaders. Um, to that end, we wanted to share that we are going to be opening another request for proposals for grants this year, and one of which could be used to support the development of teaching for equity consciousness and the development of critical consciousness in high school leaders. So again, it's kind of this larger question of how do we operationalize statewide the ethical imperative that's articulated in our mission, vision, and values, and, and then that being specific to high school leader programming. So Chris, if you could advance the slide. So we're working hard on um, a, a requ request for proposals and um, for, a, for three different buckets of grants, but I'll focus specifically on one um, related to professional development and high school leadership grants. And um, Priscilla is in the room and she and I have been trying to work on this um, the last month or so and should more information, more specific information is coming very, very soon. Um, we just got a little sidetracked by planning for the gathering and being here with you all for these two days. So please, um, please stay tuned. It's, it's coming very soon. Um, the grant opportunities could range from, um, for example, developing high school leader programming that's focused on critical consciousness, 
um, using our self-evaluation tools with high school leaders, modifying existing high school leader programming um, to increase youth voice. And we'll, we'll talk about that piece here in a, in a moment, um, which could lead to implementing youth participatory action research as an approach to helping programs um, develop critical consciousness in high school leaders and how they they teach for equity consciousness. So those those are just um, some of the things that we were brainstorming and thinking about ways in which you could use grant money to, to support your high school leader programs. And then Chris, go ahead and advance the slide. Next slide, please. So um, one of the ways in which we envision um, supporting programs is um, through programs use of YPAR or Youth Participatory Action Research. So um, YPAR is the acronym. And so this is a really innovative approach to positive youth and community development that's based in social justice principles and in which young folks, um, youth are trained to conduct systematic research that then improves their lives, their communities, and the institutions that it intend to serve them in this, in this example, outdoor school. So um, it allows youth to really redefine who has the expertise, expertise to produce knowledge in the world. So it's not just um, those of us, Stephen and I, profess, professional evaluators and researchers, but actually um, giving young people the agency to um, study the, the issues that affect their lives and come up with solutions to make some change. Um, so that might be one example of a way that which we would fund, um, fund a, a program through this grant um, with you all. So um, Steve put um, one of the resources that might be available for folks um, in outdoor school that might be interested in YPAR with youth. And then I think Chris, you can advance the slide. Um, so I just, YPAR is a really powerful approach um, to use with young folks but especially for young folks that are experiencing marginal, marginalization or multiple marginalization. And that would be, um, oh, students with intersecting identities that might be marginalized due to racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, ableism, or other forms of oppression. Um, it really promotes, YPAR really promotes young people's equity and critical consciousness by helping frame and explore the roots of problems facing their communities, outdoor schools, while holding the belief that they themselves have the skills and motivation to take action. So it's, it's a really cool approach um, in working with, with youth around finding solutions to um, problems that youth themselves define. And then lastly, um, Chris, you can advance the slide one more time for me. Um, we have some resources available for folks and um, just some examples of YPAR in action, um, some projects, some youth-led projects in Oregon that um, might be um, helpful for folks to look at. So with that, I think um, we want to maybe open the floor for some questions, some comments, um, and encourage you all if you have ideas um, or further questions beyond today, we kind of blew through this pretty quickly, that you'll please do not hesitate to reach out to any of us. Um, our, our contact info is, is on this last slide. So with that, I think um, we can open it up to open the floor for our last 15 minutes together. Thank you, Dr. Braun, Dr. Brooks, Dan, Shireen. Um, we would love to hear questions, comments, feedback. Um, feel free to uh, raise your hand, use the hand signal, or you can even post questions in the chat. And I'm sure they would love to dig into some of this more with you. I came prepared with questions, so uh, we will uh, 
I'll throw one out there to get it started. I guess <clears throat> going back to the introduction and thinking about <clears throat> the impact of these findings, the impact of this work, um, and how it might extend beyond the outdoor school setting, just thinking about youth programming in general, perhaps other type of um, outdoor recreation, outdoor education situations. What what are some of the things that, that you all are finding that you think have implications more broadly? I, I can start and then I'll, I would invite Dan, oh, and Scott has a question, thank you. Um, so I'll just speak to Chris's question real quick here, Scott. So um, what, one of, the, one of the things that was important to us um, in how, well, first of all, in, in the journal that we submitted the, the article to, and in thinking about like a broader application beyond just the Oregon outdoor school setting, we were really thinking about the ways in which this research might inform the larger field of outdoor and experiential education and then experiential education largely. Um, so a couple of things, um, how the implications beyond just outdoor school are sort of how we can support and engage high school students in this near peer mentoring role in outdoor and experiential education largely. Um, the other thing, I think the other thing really important to note is that all of the programs that we studied viewed um, high school leaders, or as we call it in the paper, high school near peer mentors as assets. And they all really invested in high school leader experience and training. Um, all of those programs uh, understood or administrators, um, uh, instructors, any anybody that worked with high school students understood that without high school leader involvement, those programs would be unable to run. But they also realized that um, high school near peer mentors or high school leaders really benefited from being involved and in participating in um, not just um, programming with fifth and sixth graders, but also how they were, how they had agency in developing the, the larger programming and curriculum. Um, so there was a little more there was a little more focus on the actual development of critical consciousness in high school leaders beyond just seeing high school students as as volunteers that kind of kept the program running and and um, Dan or Steve if you have any other anything else to add there uh, I, I totally agree and my thinking of it was sort of the other direction which is um, you know, I think what we observe at outdoor school is not necessarily the, a situation where you have an instructor who um, researches Palo Friere and then develops a program based on it, right? Like, like it's like they're doing this work and the beauty of the research is that we can look at it and go, oh, like this is what's happening. So, and I'll, and I'll just share like as a, pro, as a former program administrator, part of my job was I had a lot of folks who were doing instruction and doing really great, like implementing really great practice, but they didn't necessarily come at it from a theoretical standpoint, right? They came at it from a really practical standpoint. So being able to kind of say, hey, that thing you're doing, it's called this. And it, and if you do it even this way, it's going to be that much better. And so it's really like kind of like getting a deeper understanding of the kinds of things that are that are going on and then helping the profession really um, kind of understand how this operates so that you can um, so that you can push it to the next level, push it to the next level, get better, get better, get better. That's kind of the way I was thinking about it. And I think I'll add, um, when I think about the field broadly, environmental ed, outdoor ed, whatever, right? Um, I feel like, I feel, um, I've observed uh, and a lot of research show that we do a look and see model um, or a look and play model, right? Just experience without critical um, or working towards some sort of inquiry, which I think we often know full inquiry is very difficult. And so the depth of engagement that happens with episodic environmental ed, even some 
multi-day environmental ed is not always um, critical or profound. And so to be able to witness um, and um, you know, digest and synthesize the work that we see folks doing where um, students are engaged in a very deep and critical way and then take that and I'm just speaking towards the impact that you are all doing on the field broadly to be able to put that out. That, that feels like an honor, so thank you. Um, and that it's like, there are these models of environmental problem solving, um, which environmental ed has used for a while, right? Um, Allison asked an awesome question about why par and transformative leadership. These models exist, right? Um, that are rooted really deeply in this idea of praxis. Um, and Unfortunately, they are not as common as kids need and the world needs. And so, um, yeah, you know, keep up that work and like, it's, it's awesome to be able to witness. All right, I think I'll, I'll jump in here. <clears throat> First of all, thanks for uh, inspiring me to look up the, uh, the definition of praxis a few weeks ago when I first read your paper, I appreciate that, it's nice to see a new word. Um, and uh, I, um, I want to also appreciate you all. Uh, I, I've, I've been working in the field for a lot of years and, and I have a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal knowledge and, um, you know, to actually see research that affirms some of the things that are, that I believe I think is really awesome. Um, it also begs the question about a lot more research in this space. Um, I'm curious, you know, we kind of are a closed community in many ways, you know, talking to each other. I'm curious how this uh, might be shared out with decision makers who uh, have the ability to impact high school leader participation in our programs. Um, administrators at the at the superintendent and at the principal and even classroom teacher level who um, can give permission for students or encouragement and support to students to participate in our, our programs, um, as well as, you know, just our programs focusing and practicing these things uh, as, as affirmations to our student leaders. And so I'm curious if there is a, a plan for that or some thoughts around that. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for that question. Um, so one of the reasons why we distilled the research into this research brief um, that we shared is so that um, we could have something to go out with um, a, a, our um, what we call our TriFan, which is our um, outcomes evaluation kind of distilled down. We're, we're, the plan is to do kind of a large mailing to all of our um, our ESD and district contacts. So that that's kind of a next step and one of the reasons we created this um, this research brief that's a little less rooted in academic language and is a little more accessible. Um, and yeah, thank you to Rita. I don't think she's in the room, but Rita is so amazing at translating um, academic language to more practitioner language and helping us kind of create um, resources that folks find a little more accessible. Um, some of us get a little stuck in, in academic language and um, that necessarily, that isn't necessarily helpful. So to your point, Scott, um, we plan to do kind of a big, um, a big mass mailing here soon so that this work can get into the hands of folks at the district level. Awesome question. I think we're all smiling like, yeah, right? Because I, I think we've, I've heard there's barriers for certain kids to go um, that exist in teachers' perceptions and the district's perceptions. And those, I want to say barriers, hurdles, you know, tensions, um, they need to be addressed. And so, yeah, I think I, I'd just love to hear if anyone folks have ideas on that. Um, I just... Yeah, I just, I just sent Dan a text, so yeah. <laughs> I'd like to just jump in real quick on the grant opportunity spirit brought up. And one of those aspects is encouraging the collaboration of everyone or the buy-in 
So if you were to look for, hey, we've got this idea of how we can get the buy-in of teachers, maybe it is that they participate in outdoor school with their high school students for a couple of years to get that buy-in, um, whatever solution you think might work for a community buy-in, we would love to see that in those proposals along with the other things that Spirit had talked about. Thank you, Priscilla. And then um, Chris just added in the chat that we're working with ODE um, as well as legislators because we we recognize just how critically important the high school leader component is to those students' development. Um, they're just a huge part of outdoor school in Oregon, and and it's it's really really important. Um, Chris's point to this practice of marking high school leaders absent and some, most of the time unexcused um, absences while they're serving at outdoor school is, is something that um, we're, we're really trying to work, work through. Um, and then again, educating administrators. One of the ways in which we hope to do that is by sharing this research. Um, thanks, Spirit. And I was I was frantically typing in the chat and realized I can just say this way faster if I just unmute. Um, and that is that I think, um, Scott, you referred to this sort of like insular world. Well, that uh, the world of school district administration is the same, right? And so people are talking to each other inside that world. But we have champions um, and people who really believe in this stuff that are district administrators, superintendents, principals. And so I think um, supplying them with this research so that they can be communicating with their peers and um, their colleagues is going to be really powerful. So I'd like us to explore that. We might be able to explore some ways to do that through the roundtable, the monthly roundtable or some other ways. So i um, interested to work with everybody on that. All right. Well, thank you all for joining this session. Um, certainly come away with some, some really cool opportunities and learnings. And I want to thank our presenters again for not only coming today and sharing their work with us, but the work that they're engaged in in an ongoing basis. It's really, really exciting. And it's also exciting to see the benefit of this work on the actual high school students um, and thinking about how they benefit these fifth and sixth graders, but um, receive this benefit themselves in, in this work is really exciting. Um, just want to remind you, uh, Steve. Yeah, I just, I realized we didn't say this, but just as an FYI, everyone, um, we're actually developing a battery of questions uh, to be included in the outcome uh, surveys moving forward. So just, I realized we didn't even talk about a next step in terms of research. And this is one of the many next steps. And so, so